Here are my disclosures, a little cleanup from yesterday. So my references on the slides yesterday, um, if you actually just put them right into PubMed, they wouldn't bring up these articles. So these are the two articles I recommend reading if you have interest. Um, all right, so today we're gonna cover uh, literature linking erectile dysfunction to systemic vascular disease, try to understand the corollary between vascular disease and its treatment to erectile dysfunction, and then talk a little bit about pudendal artery stenting. So recall that erections are a neurovascular event. Uh, requires intact nervous system, healthy arteries, competent veins. There's stimulation that's occurring off screen, which is activating the nervous system, which then obviously allows the arteries to dilate, blood, uh, blood to flow in. When we look at the cause of erectile dysfunction, 80% is thought to be caused by vasculogenic causes. That's from either defects in cavernosal smooth muscle relaxation, arterial inflow, or venous leak. And then the rest of the 20% comes from stuff that we do from prostatectomy or the list. Now here we see a, you know, a cartoon of a flaccid and erect penis. Uh, I always like to talk to my patients of the analogy of their penis being like a, uh, a bike tire. And uh, you know, when the person pumping the air in is like the artery inflow, and then the inner tube or the lining of the bike tire is the venous competence, right? So when the arteries go in, this blue veins on the outside of the penis get compressed passively. And uh, so the passive system is only if the arteries expand adequately will the veins be closed and you'll get a good erection. And I describe venous leak to patients as like a leaky bike tire. So when I talk about penile implants, I tell them I'm simply putting a new inner tube inside that uh, space uh, to allow fluid to go back in there and stay in there. Okay, so here is a see-through artery naked man and he tells us that heart health equals penis health. Uh, the idea that uh, the penis is predictive for heart disease, I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Uh, but some of the early work uh, and proposed theories was done by Montorsi in 2003, basically stating or showing the relative sizes of the vessels feeding the penis, one to two millimeters, the coronaries, three to four, uh, the carotids and the uh, legs, you know, respectively. And so if the patients follow the textbook, they should get ED first, followed by their MI, followed by a stroke, and then claudication if they decided to follow what this picture looked like. Uh, again, this is intuitive that uh, this would be the case, and ED would be the first sign as, you know, if they're all occlude at the same rate, the smallest vessel is going to be affected first. Uh, obviously, there are many shared risk factors listed here that affect both the penis and the heart. So an interesting, very early study in 2004 looked at first saw that, hey, if guys with ED, they do have systemic problems. So they took two well-matched well, group, uh, well -matched, uh, groups of men, uh, one with ED and one without, and they applied a blood pressure cuff, and then they used a device to uh, measure the uh, vasodilatory response of the upstream vessels. And lo and behold, they found that men with erectile dysfunction had a blunted response. Uh, basically, 10,000 men in the prostate cancer prevention trial were followed they didn't have cardiovascular disease at study entry, uh, and then a certain proportion, about half, had ED. Then they followed these men for many years, and lo and behold, that they found that the guys with ED at the beginning of the study had a higher relative risk of having cardiac events. This relative risk turned out to be 1.6-fold, which is similar to the uh, increased risk that a man would have with active current smoking or a family history of myocardial infarction. So again, this turns out to be a very powerful predictor. And there we see the incidence of problems in men with ED, and finally, the data itself showing increased risk with significance of both heart attacks, strokes, uh, any kind of cardiovascular event, et cetera. So one of my more favorite studies to quote is this Inman study, is out of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Basically, they took 1,400 men uh, in Minnesota, and these were predominantly white group of men, and they followed them for 10 years, screened biennially. Um, at baseline, none of them had erectile dysfunction or coronary artery disease and they adjusted for everything they could in terms of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, BMI, et cetera. Now, as the study progressed, 11% of the men developed heart disease, 15% of the guys got MIs, 80% had uh, angiographic abnormalities, and 6% just dropped dead. When we looked at the relative, now when, we, when they looked at the relative cardiac incident densities for guys with and without ED, we saw this stunning increased risk with erectile dysfunction, which I will essentially depict here the, uh, the very tall columns are the men who developed ED, and the very short columns are the men who did not develop ED over this 10-year period. So you can see the relative risk of a cardiac event defined in this study as 
um, angina or a heart, heart attack or angiographic abnormality was 52-fold higher in men age 40 to 49. That is just an absurd increased risk. So John McEnroe says, indeed, you cannot be serious. It is serious. So the young man is the guy that we need to target as uh, coronary artery disease. You know, every marathon that gets run, a skinny, healthy person drops dead, right? So ED relation to coronary artery uh, timing. So we, we do know that's predictive, but you know, what's the timing like? Well, two studies I'll quote you here. One is by Hodges. Basically, they took men with match controls, and five years before their first coronavascular disease is when their erectile dysfunction occurred. Montorsi, uh, a different uh, approach, but found a similar finding about 39 months before is when the first uh, heart attack occurred. So it's interesting when you get guys with heart attacks, ask them about their erect erections, and most of the time, not always, but most of the time they'll say, yeah, you know, this happened a few years ago, I started noticing problems. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of uh, Graham Jackson. He's a cardiologist from England who died uh, last year. He did a tremendous amount of work in this field. Uh, he was always a very kind man, a good mentor to me. Uh, the other thing, the implications for this is uh, basically we need to shift how we treat younger patients. So a young patient with ED less than age 60, it changes the cardiologist's paradigm of what they're supposed to do based on some of this work. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, clearly, the more severe the ED, the greater the CV risk, uh, it goes without saying. But so here's what a cardiologist will look, will look at and you know, figure out you know, what to do next. So if you take young men that have ED, that automatically puts them in this intermediate risk category, which then tells us we should probably do this uh, additional testing and then send them to the cardiology. So penile Doppler is a great test. If that uh, shows arterial insufficiency, I send them to the cardiologist and they get the book thrown at them. You have to be uh, very careful because some cardiologists will just do a stress test, all right? And like a, like a EKG stress test, not a treadmill test. That is not gonna show the type of lesion in the young man that you can prevent and pre you know, prevent death with. They're not gonna get angina or any kind of response from going on a treadmill. I mean, think of the, the marathon runner types. So uh, the correct testing is up to the cardiologist, but if you wanna get cut right to the chest, the chase, you need to just essentially get you know, angiography of the heart to look at vessel. Um, occlusion. So what does ED equal? Well, it's a canary. That's the canaries in my talk, the canary in the coal mine. ED equals erectile dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, early detection, exercise and diet, and early death. So I contend that we should use the penis as a fulcrum to get guys to do what we want them to do. If we tell them that, you know, they have a 8% less risk of a heart attack, uh, if they exercise, that's one thing. But if we tell them their penis is going to work better, uh, that's another. So I think we should take advantage of that motivational factor. So knowing what we know that erections cause problems with uh, the heart, uh, you're now on the jury of a, a panel, right? And a guy, a 55-year-old guy that got a prescription for Viagra uh, drops dead uh, wherever during sex. It's rare, but maybe it'll happen. And now the lawyer is saying, well, doctor, did you check his... Uh, did you check this guy's uh, lipids? Did you check his hemoglobin A1C? And I don't know, what does, the, what does the urologist say? Most urologists don't check these things, right? So the point of this question is, if you don't check it, you better refer the patient to someone who does. Because uh, if you're gonna be writing these scripts, I think you're probably medically on the hook. And this is indeed a real case um, that did occur. I don't know the outcome, but I know it happened. Okay, so, uh, that being said, is sex safe? Fonzie says yes. So sex only mildly elevates heart rate, respirations, and blood pressure, similar to a light exercise. It turns out that you know, most guys, uh, it only takes like two minutes and there isn't much uh, cardiac output uh, during the event. So that's probably why it's safe, right? Um, so, and they did a lot of Holter monitor studies for guys with you know, heart conditions during sex, and it turns out, yeah, it's safe. Again, this is Graham Jackson's work. So, lifestyle modification. Um, tell these gentlemen to stop smoking, to follow a he healthy diet, exercise regularly, weight loss. All of these things help. Uh, clearly, we see here that, you know, uh, in Canada, they actually take advantage of this, right? They have like a limp cigarette on the package, the carton. It shows like a limp, you know, it's like a phallic structure showing that you know, smoking will cause ED. Um, exercise is particularly powerful. It's amazing what this can do. Uh, 
you know, here's a, essentially a meta-analysis uh, on the left showing that lifestyle intervention has a true effect on erections. So if you can tell the patients if they have even modest weight loss, if they can start exercising more, their penis will get better. Uh, and, you know, it's not necessarily about it working by itself, but maybe you can get them to a place where now the pills will actually work for them. Remember that to exercise upregulates uh, nitric oxide. It's good to have a lot of nitric oxide around for PD-5 inhibitors to work essentially. So, um, yeah, exercise is good. Keep doing that. But getting to the practical uh, side, you see this cartoon here, Doc, give it to me straight. How long do I have to ignore your advice, right? So we can tell them all these things till we're blue in the face, but ultimately they're going to want the pills or kind of intervention or treatment that uh, will fix the problem, which brings us to our next uh, animal of the day, the giraffe. So does anybody know what the giraffe's claim to fame is? It has a long neck, that's correct. It has the highest blood pressure in the animal kingdom, by far, getting up to 300 uh, millimoles mercury, right? They gotta like, they gotta like turn their head, they gotta eat the, the leaves without getting dizzy and you know, falling down and having uh, orthostatics. So it turns out that the giraffe has amazing, you know, mechanisms to produce this really high heart rate, or heart, heart, high blood pressure. The heart is normal size, but the thickness of the myocardium is like double or triple that of most animals. And so then it keeps the radius small within the chambers of the heart and increases the power. So now you can really jack up uh, the blood pressure. The other thing that the giraffe has, and the reason I'm telling you about the giraffe, is it has these remarkable, essentially carotid arteries. And the carotid arteries of the giraffe are unlike many other vessels uh, in the mammalian kingdom in that they have this amazing adaptive property to remodel and they get super thick and strong. So they can accommodate this very high blood pressure without exploding. Turns out there's one blood vessel in the human which is a, has very similar properties, and that vessel is the pudendal artery. So think about it. What other blood vessel in humans has relatively low flow at this point, right time in the audience? I'd, I'd speculate that 85 to 90 percent of the flow of the pudendal artery is somewhere around five millimeters, uh, you know, five centimeters per second. Now, about 10 percent of the population has about maybe, depending on. You know, never mind. 80, you know, 80 millimeters of uh, centimeters per second velocity flowing through the pudendal artery. So that's a very unique thing. So uh, investigator Mike Adams, uh, he's done a lot of work in this area, and so he started uh, testing uh, uh, rats. And so this is, these are pudendal artery rats right here, uh, and you can see that they have this when they they did uh, pathology on these rats with like hypertension and these different models. They saw this weird remodeling in the pudendals that they don't see in any other vessel. And so, lo and behold, the pudendal artery has these unique properties to accommodate the fact that flow changes and it gets very, very high relative to what things normally are, similar to the giraffe. So further testing showed that when you look at the vascular tree of the penis, the pudendal artery is the gatekeeper. So if you can get the gatekeeper wide open and flowing well, the penis is going to fill with blood effectively. However, if the pudendal artery has narrowing in it, i.e. from coronary vascular disease, coronary artery disease, it ain't going to work too well. So, then the next idea is, hey, why don't we treat the penis like we do vessels in the heart? Stick a stent in there, open it up, help with the flow. So the Zen trial was born. So this was a Medtronic-based study uh, of which I was uh, fortunate enough to participate in, where basically they wanted to put a stent in the pudendal arteries and see what happened. Would it improve erections? And it was a zuterulimus eluding peripheral stent. Uh, these patients were put on um, blood thinners, it was a tremendous screening protocol to have to try to find them, we'll get to uh, in a second. But let's look at an, an example. So this is a patient of mine who got a penile Doppler. I did like 300 Dopplers to find 10 to 20 potential candidates for this study. It was just crazy, to, hard to find them. So they had to have arterial insufficiency and no signs of venous leak whatsoever, right? Because if you're going to increase the blood flow of the penis, if you can't keep the blood trapped in there, it ain't going to do any good. Right? So they couldn't have venous leak and they had to have definitive arterial insufficiency and then they only had to be to the point where they just started failing PD-5 inhibitors. Right? So they kind of like mild ED. So we found him. So here's a guy and uh, we're looking at the view of his left uh, pudendal artery there and you can see this area of narrowing right here. So again, you see now you start to see a wire kind of coming down in there. And boom, they pop a stent in, which is kind of hard to see, but it's kind of has like a mesh-like pattern. You can see that this whole area is now wide open, right? 
And then if you look at repeat andrographs, all of a sudden you see the blood vessels of the penis lighten up like a Christmas tree. So there it is. Now, beautiful pictures. This is a success story, right? You would not believe how we struggled to A, find these patients, B, figuring out what vessel to stent. You know, be like, we had to give the guys erections to see if we could drop blood in to see if we could do the right thing. We gave approximately four to five men excellent quality bowel movements because we stented their rectal artery instead of the pudendal arteries, right? <laughs> so it was difficult. Um, what do we find? So it had this unique screening protocol, which I talked about. We had to do all these Dopplers to find them. And it turned out no penis exploded, no penis fell off. That was a very big concern that there was going to be penile hearing. So that didn't happen. The preliminary, the primary endpoint of the study was to improve the IEF by a certain number of points, and indeed that end point was met. It was a smart endpoint because it was like a temporary improvement uh, by the patient. So 70% improved, and this is intention to treat analysis, so these have the guys with the improved rectal artery stents in there, so technically they shouldn't have gotten better unless there's a placebo effect with that. Um, <clears throat> the problem was that although several patients did very well, and you know, thought we did great work, they reoccluded. Okay, so one patient in particular, he had horrible inflow, like you know, eight centimeters per second. Uh, he was like a vascular path. We stented him, and then when we did the repeat Doppler to prove that his flow was improved, he got priapism with like a tiny dose. We could not get his erection to go away, right? So wow, this stuff is amazing. Three months later, Doc's not working anymore. So uh, we did another angiogram. He had reoccluded. He had continued to smoke, continued to do all the bad things. Boom, the stents reoccluded. We dilated it again. Lo and behold, the, the penis worked again for a while, and then it reoccluded. So proof of concept, this is great. But it brings in the challenges to pudendal artery set. Number one, it's really hard to find these patients. Uh, I think there's probably some promise in the future with uh, CT, uh, you know, high speed CTs with contrast, but these vessels are so small, they're so hard to get to. Maybe MRI is gonna be the answer. So finding the right patient to put a stent is number one. The next problem is it's hard to do this, to get uh, the interventional radiologist to stent the right vessel. Now, granted, people are doing pudendal artery embolization, and that's even harder because it's even further downstream. But for us, it was difficult to become good at this. Uh, also, remember that because the pudendal artery is unique, it has very little blood flow most of the time, right? So it's going to clog because there's no flow in it. Uh, the coronary, coronaries have constant flow to keep the pipeline open, but the penis, you know, 90 to 95 percent of the time, very low flow. And so I think you really have a problem with occlusion. And then the final thing is that, you know, even when we get heart stents, this doesn't extend our life, right? Getting a stent, that doesn't extend our life. It simply allows us to do the things that we need to do that will extend our life. It lets us exercise without pain, right? That's all what stents do. If you do nothing with stents, you have no increased life expectancy. Uh, and so the same thing is true with this. If you put a stent in, maybe they'll change their lifestyle uh, and they'll keep the, the pedendal from reoccluding, but that's the problem. So not ready for prime time because uh, it's gonna reocclude and Medtronic pulled the plug. So I wrote the second part of this trial, impasse. They funded it and then promptly defunded it. So. Here's the moral of the story. Heart healthy equals penis healthy. Uh, consider exercising to help your penis, and pudendal artery stenting is not ready for prime time. Thank you.